worship Jesus. That's very, very good advice. And uh, let's pray together. Lord God, loving Heavenly Father, we thank you for your voice that on the Mount of Transfiguration <clears throat> told Peter, James, and John that Jesus is your Son and commanded them to listen to him. Help us to listen to him above the hubbub of voices that call to us. Help us to hear Jesus, and as we hear him, help us to obey him and to follow him. And be with us now as we look at your word. We ask that your Holy Spirit, who caused all Holy Scripture to be written, would be at work in us now, in our hearts, our minds, our imaginations, that we would understand what you're saying to us and that we would follow you and obey you in our lives day by day by day. So we thank you, Father, and we ask this prayer in the name of your Son, our Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. I'm assuming that everyone here has been tempted. Am I right? Please put your hand up if you've never been tempted. Okay, so we're all in this together, right? And uh, this, the gospel reading this morning uh, focuses on that. And it focuses on the fact that Jesus himself was tempted on more than one occasion, we presume. But uh, on certain, Matthew has given us these three little vignettes of Jesus being tempted. And so in this, as in all things, Jesus is our model. Jesus is our example because he's experienced all the temptations that we have even though ours may not have been quite as, what could we say, spectacular as the ones that happen in our gospel reading, they are nonetheless um, of the same order. And maybe we'll find that out as we progress this morning. So short history of temptation. There you go. This is, a, uh, this is the temptation, the rosy red apple. It hasn't got a chunk out of it yet, because the temptation hasn't been given into yet by Adam and Eve. That's why it's still there. Temptation in all its manifest forms presents itself to us. And it's always presented as a really good idea. Apples are good. I like apples. But the one particular one in Genesis had a special significance. Now, the kind of apples we get here in Quebec won't kill you, but the fruit on the, a particular tree in uh, Genesis 3 would have done exactly that. And God says, look, Adam and Eve, man and woman, I've created this beautiful world for you, but you need to know how to enjoy it to the full, to the best. And I'm going to tell you, there are wonderful trees here and bushes and shrubs, and many of them produce fantastic fruit that will delight your taste buds and will fascinate your eyes and will give wonderful smells to your nostrils. And I want you to enjoy it all. All these many, many different varieties. Aren't they good? Yes, they are good. But there's one tree that you really should not taste of, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And why? Because if you do, you're going to die. And you won't like that. Well, of course, you won't be alive to know whether you like it or not. But I'm telling you, don't eat of that tree because I don't want you to die. Because I want you to continue to live and enjoy everything that I've created for you. So don't eat of that tree, okay? So as you know, if you can remember what happens in Genesis uh, 2, um, Genesis 3 comes next, and there's God telling Adam and Eve um, that you can eat of everything. There's a tree with grapes apparently there. That's marvelous. But don't eat of the, uh, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Because if you do, you're going to die. And that's not a good thing. That's not what I want. Okay? And, um, but then the, the tempter comes along, the serpent in, in Genesis 3, and says, Did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden of course he didn't say that at all did he he said you can eat of any tree in the garden except one that's all he said but the tempter comes and distorts what god says 
It kind of sounds similar, but it's not the same. It's in fact very different. So one of the tactics of the tempter is to distort God's word. Eve is a very smart woman, as most women are in my experience, very smart. And she knows that that's not what God said. So she said, no, no, no. God didn't say that. He said, we can eat of any tree, but just mustn't eat of this special tree, because if we do, we die. And then the tempter comes in with his total 100% refutation of, of, God, of what God said. He said, you won't die. God's lying. God's just telling you that because he doesn't want you to have this knowledge of good and evil. God actually doesn't have your best interests at heart. And they think about that, and you know what happens? They go ahead and eat. But I think that's very similar to what, the, how we experience temptation. Often we have a distortion. We hear a distortion of, of what God has said. And sometimes we don't know enough to know what Eve knew. She, she knew that, wait a minute, God didn't say that. So sometimes we're confused and we think, well, maybe God did say that and we missed it. So I think one of the things that we can learn from this, and we learn it again from Jesus, is that we have got to have the uh, storerooms of our minds at the larders of our hearts stop with scripture so we actually know what pleases God. So when a distortion comes up and says, oh, that's not what God says, we actually know. So we need to be familiar with God and what God says. And of course, did God really say you must not eat? Well, no. But they, they took the fruit and they ate it. And she gave some to her husband, and husbands often do, said, yes, dear, and took the apple and, and ate it as well. And they both did. So there you are. They're both eating of the tree. And so we fast forward to our gospel reading. Um, there's Jesus in the wilderness. And there the tempter comes to him, not this time in the form of a serpent, um, but in the artist's imagination, it's actually as a religious person. Isn't that interesting? But you can tell that he's not a good guy because he's got a pair of horns on his head. That's just a hint, you know, if, if you didn't get it, that he, he, he's not in fact a good guy. But sometimes even uh, temptation can, fall, can take on a, a religious form. And so there's Jesus being tempted. He's been in the uh, desert for 40 days. He's hungry. And so the first temptation comes along. The devil suggests to him, you must be hungry, Jesus, aren't you? Yeah, I am hungry. Well, you're the son of God, aren't you? And remember, before this episode has happened, Jesus has been baptized by his cousin John in the Jordan River. And God's voice had proclaimed, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. And then we fast forward to the scene of the temptation. And so the evil one comes along. Oh, you're God's son, are you? Well, Jesus knows he is, because the father's just told him that previously. He says, well, if you're God's son, turn these rocks into bread. You're hungry. You can do this. Do this. And Jesus thinks about it momentarily, and then says, no. We shall live not by bread alone, but on every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Jesus is using his knowledge of God that he has acquired through experience, but also through the knowledge of Scripture. The Scripture says, we shall not live by bread alone. And so he's able to respond to the evil one's suggestion here, the suggestion, the temptation, if you like, is to satisfy your immediate gratification. Well, you can just, you don't have to go to a boulangerie. You've, well, you can turn these rocks into really good bread, better than Premier Moisson. Right now, you're the son of God, aren't you? Prove it. Do this. It would have been easy, wouldn't it, to do that? But apparently for Jesus it wouldn't, because it would have meant not believing in his father and his father's way. The way of sensation, 
the way of personal immediate gratification was not Jesus' way. We know what his way is going to be. It's a way that leads to the cross. It's not the easy way of instant gratification, even though that's the temptation. And sometimes we are tempted uh, with the alluring possibility of immediate instant gratification. But it is not God's way. And we need to understand that. And we need to be able to say, well, yeah, that's a very tempting idea, but I'm not going to do that because it's not God's way. So we need to know which is God's way and which is not God's way. And we need to be able to tell the difference. And Jesus does that here. But of course, the tempter doesn't leave Jesus alone, does he? And we are not left alone without temptations. It's not just one temptation, it's many temptations. The next one, Jesus is carried up to the top of the temple. And this time, the tempter uses scripture against Jesus. You're the God's son? Prove it. Because it says in the scriptures, his angels will bear you up, the, you up on their hands. So why don't you do it? This is a great place. There's lots of people here. They all see you. You want to make known that you're God's son, don't you? So just jump off. The angels will zoom in. Uh, pick you up and everyone will go, oh, that's incredible. You must be the Messiah. And you go, well, actually, yes, you're right. I am. I'm pleased to meet you. Well, you too. Uh, you know, and he's, he's saying that you shall not test the Lord your God. That is not God's way. He knows that. He's able to pull down a, a, a fragment of scripture and, and use that to refute the tempter here. In so many ways, the temptations that come to us will be temptations to deviate from God's way, to do things the way of the world, the easy way, the convenient way. No one will ever know. God knows everything. And so behind every temptation, there is the, the, the not the possibility, it's, it will be um, departing from God's way. That's what's behind every temptation. So we may not be carried up to the top of the uh, CN Tower or Place Ville Marie and, and told to jump down. Our temptations will be different, but each of them will be temptations to step away from God's path and go our own way. And it will not be a good idea. Jesus says when these things happen, it will actually be better for you. If you're tempted by what your eyes are seeing, it's going to be better for you to remove your eyes than to give in to those temptations. Sounds very extreme. It is extreme. He says again, look, if you're tempted to go out and take things that aren't yours, it would, better, it would be better to cut your hands off so you can't do that. Why, why blow your life on these momentary fleeting temptations? Obviously, Jesus is using cartoon language here, but he's helping us to see the difference that temptations will come to us through our eyes, through itchy hands that want to get ourselves on the latest uh, iPhone maybe, and when we can't afford it, we would like it, and we, we've got to say, wait a minute, that is not God's way. You shall not steal is one of the Ten Commandments. Uh, and we need to know these things and we need to um, have the resolve that Jesus shows us to walk in his Father's way. And also we've got a help here because we know that Jesus, our great high priest, has been tempted in every way that we are. Isn't that a comfort? I think it does. I think it is, because sometimes we can feel I'm the only person in the world who's ever experienced this temptation. We may think that. It's not true. And in fact, not only has plenty of other people experienced it, but Jesus did. Wow. The Son of God, the Messiah, he experienced the temptations that I'm experiencing. That's incredible. But the one difference is, of course, he did not give in to those temptations, and sometimes we do, sadly. Sometimes we do. But another help here is to remember that Jesus has been tempted, and he understands. He doesn't think we're terrible people because we're tempted. We have the opportunity to say no to temptation, as he did. And St. Paul gives us some real help here. 
And when he says, no temptation has overcome you except what is common to mankind. It's common. Everyone has it. God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. How many of you knows how much you can bear? Do you? I don't. I don't know what the limits are on, on my temptation. But God does. And he says, uh, well, Paul says that God will not let you be tempted beyond your limit. So presumably, working back from that, any temptation that I experience is a temptation that I can resist, right? It must be, because God won't, be, won't let me be tempted beyond uh, what I can cope with. Even more good news, when you are tempted, not if, when you are tempted, because it will happen, God will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. A way out. Brilliant. An exit strategy. When you're tempted, do you look around for the exit strategies? Do you look around for the exits? Or are you so dazzled by the temptation that you forget that God has actually provided an exit? So when we are, when not if, when we are tempted, we need to look around for the exits. And also, when we are tempted, we need to use those exits and not say, oh, well, I, you know, the power of temptation is so strong. I just can't resist. It's impossible. Well, wait a minute. You can resist and God won't let you be tempted beyond your limits that you have got. And we've all got limits, but he will provide an exit. So what am I going to do? Am I going to choose to just focus on the temptation or am I going to run for the exit? I hope, I hope I'm one of those who's going to run for the exit and take advantage on that which God has provided. So bad news, good news. Bad news first. Jesus says, in this world, you will have trouble. Oh, no. Gosh, golly darn. I don't want trouble. No, no one does. The good news is, take heart, I've overcome the world. And so our temptations will come to us in various forms. But we need to take heart that Jesus understands those. He's been tempted in exactly the same ways, same types of temptations, that God knows our limits, won't let us be tempted beyond those limits, and also will provide a way out, which we need to take. And Jesus has overcome that. So we need to be people who take God at his word, just as Jesus did with the devil in the wilderness. And say, wait a minute, Jesus has overcome the world, so I can resist this quite small temptation. Because Jesus has overcome that. And I'm going to deliberately walk in Jesus' way and refuse to walk in any other way. That's the challenge that's before us every day of the week to walk in the way of Jesus. And so we can be strengthened by the knowledge that we can choose to trust God and to follow the way of Jesus. So that's, I think, a one way in to our beginning of keeping Lent, that we need to recognize temptation, we need to see it for what it is. It's the, the lure of disobeying God and walking according to another path. May each one of us resolve, not just at Lent, but year round until we see Jesus face to face, to walk in his ways with the strength that he has given us because he has overcome the world. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus Christ, we thank you that you have been tempted in every way as we are, but without sin. We thank you too that the Heavenly Father knows our limits and won't allow us to be tempted beyond those limits. Thank you, too, that he always provides a way out. Help us to take the way out, to understand when we are being tempted, and to resolve to walk in your ways. Strengthen us, we pray, to follow you in this world where there will be trouble, where there will be temptations. But help us to be those who follow you and uh, seek your path and follow it, whatever the consequences. These things we ask in your holy name, Lord Jesus. Amen.
Oh, I forgot that I had a really...